There we go. Morning. Uh, all right. So good thing I wrote myself a little note here. Um, right. We kind of ended off in a in a flurry of things because I wanted to kind of cover the material in 1.4. Let's do let's do some review. Um, and we'll, we'll use this problem as review, but really we were just simplifying fractions, right? So ultimately rational functions are just fractions. So uh, it could involve factoring, factoring to cancel, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So let's see here. So we said we were gonna do number 81 as review next day. Here we are next day, time flies. So I'm just gonna copy this in here and throw it in here. So just as a, a quick review, what did we do last day? Uh, <laughs> oh, we basically just simplified, simplifying rational expressions, right? A rational expression, is anything uh, that's a polynomial over a polynomial, right? So, and a polynomial is just a, a list of terms with different powers of x. Um, only one variable is allowed, right? So x or y or t, but not all of those together. Um, and then coefficients and different powers, but ultimately, uh, if you're able to recognize a polynomial, then uh, that'll serve you really well. So things like, uh, 2x squared plus 4x plus, well, I guess I could use a number, plus 3, Ooh, creative, 2, 4, 3. Wow. Um, that's a special type of polynomial, right? It's a quadratic that we've learned to recognize, um, but it is a polynomial, right? And so polynomial just means multiple terms like this. Okay. Even something like this, it's a monomial, uh, but it is, we can put it in the category of polynomial. So, uh, so we were simplifying rational expressions. We were uh, kind of multiplying, multiplying, dividing, multiplying and dividing, adding and subtracting fractions essentially, right? Rational functions or, or rational expressions are just fractions, right? Uh, or adding and subtracting uh, fractions. But we made them bigger. So we've spent a lot of time working with fractions, right? So we know we need a common denominator. All those rules followed us in here. Uh, even when we're working with these bigger problems, right? So uh, these rational expressions are just fractions, uh, but now we have x's and, and things in there. So um, we did quite a few. Uh, we even looked at compound fractions, compound fractions and dealing with those. But really, if you just break them down, um, and, and work with the numerator first. So a compound fraction is something where you have uh, like one plus and then a fraction, and then that's all over maybe a fraction minus four or something like that, right? So that's a compound fraction where uh, if, you, if you break down the term, right? Compound just means smushed together and then fractions, uh, compound fractions is just multiple fractions in one, in one problem, right? So uh, we did some of those, but I guess let's do a compound fraction just for, for practice uh, as part of us, our review, because that's going to be really good, right? So I do want to do 81, but I want to do a compound fraction first. So we've got a bunch to choose from here. Uh, how about... How about we do 71? Let's do 71 for, for just a little bit of review, right? So here, this is a compound fraction 
because you've got fractions inside fractions, right? So let's do 71. So I've got one minus, and it's really important that you keep track of what's part of the fraction, what's not, so that one outside is not part of the fraction, right? And so um, one minus one over one minus one over x. And I like to, uh, as much as I can, I like to use my, my lines on my paper, right? Um, just to kind of see uh, what's below each value. So here, what we have to do is you have to start with the, um, uh, I wanna say like the lowest um, fraction and then you have to build it up, right? So if you were to start with this subtraction here, you would have to put this one over a common denominator of one minus one over X, which would also require a common denominator. So you start down here and you simplify that and then you can just kind of roll it up. Okay. And uh, okay, so this becomes, right, leaving this part alone, I'm going to simplify one minus one over x. And so I need a common denominator, I know that, right? So here we go, oops, one minus one divided by one. And then I, I'll use a different color because I want you to see uh, that I'm multiplying by x over x to force that common denominator minus one over x. Okay. So now I'm allowed to, to simplify that guy. One minus one over x minus one over x. Okay. I've got, uh, I've got some options here. So what I can do is I, I could use this as my common denominator over here. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna do this division first because uh, it, it'll be easier if I just have uh, one minus a fraction, right? Then I just need to find one common denominator, not something weird like this. Um, you can, you absolutely can, but you'd have to multiply by x minus one over x over x minus one over x, making kind of a mess. Right, so we're allowed to simplify this division first. That's fine. So I can rewrite one as one over one, right? Then I have a fraction over a fraction. So if I have a fraction over a fraction, I need to flip the denominator and then I can multiply, right? And so here, this becomes one minus one and then uh, let's see here. I'll put it over one in a different color because it's it's not actually necessary to show it, but I just want to emphasize that one you can write as one over one. And then I always have to kind of attach the numbers to my fingers when I flip them because for some reason I, I can't see the flip, but um, that's okay. So x minus one over x flips to be x over x minus one. So this is times x over x minus one. Multiplying, right? Remember bed mass. So if I've got division or multiplication, I have to do that first, right? So I have to do this multiplication first before I can go ahead and uh, subtract it from one. So multiplying fractions, that's I dare say easy now, right? Because we've done it so much, but you just multiply across. So you get x over x minus one. Now to simplify this even further, right? I need to, I have a, essentially a fraction minus a fraction, right? One, I can rewrite as one over one. So I have a fraction minus a fraction and I can uh, subtract those by finding the common denominator. I'm going to use x minus 1 as my common denominator. So I end up with 1, and then I'll do it in a different color, times x minus 1 over x minus 1 minus x over x minus 1. Okay. Putting this over the common denominator and just kind of expanding, 
one time something, I'm not going to bother, you know, showing that as one step. I'm going to just combine the numerator. So I get x minus 1 minus x over x minus 1. And x minus x is going to go away. So I just have minus 1 or negative 1 over x minus 1. <clears throat> You could move that negative around. I'm just going to leave it where it is. Okay. So that's a compound fraction, right? Uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to start, uh, like I said, just kind of uh, start simplifying the numerator and denominator individually. And then um, what ends up happening is you just kind of roll it up, right? So here you just kind of uh, roll it into one fraction. And maybe I should write it as negative one instead. Good. Okay, so now I think we're ready to do 81, which I said uh, we would do for review. So I'll just grab it, copy, paste. Oh. Okay. This one, okay, so now, remember I assigned it because uh, we've got these fractional exponents, which I know no one likes, right? But we have to remember the exponent laws. And so, um, and we can always factor out the lowest power, right? So in this case, I can factor out the lowest power of one plus X. I have one plus X to the one half and I have one plus X to the negative one half. So the lowest power is negative one half. I am able to pull that out. I'm able to extract that from um, one plus x to the one half. Sorry, I did it earlier and I just realized I can probably make it a little bit nicer, but uh, no, I can't. It's okay, that's okay. I just had a little eureka, but no, didn't work out, that happens. Okay, so the question says, simplify the expression. Okay, and then it's, it's got kind of a, a warning or like a, a, a sneak preview, right? So uh, here, if we use the quotient rule, so when you go into to calculus, calc one, um, we'll use the, the quotient rule and, uh, and then we'll have to deal with, with stuff like this. To be quite honest, mostly they're going to be just kind of nice powers, right? We're not going to have to deal with fractional powers. But in this course, right, we, we've we already practiced factoring these, uh, these uh, fractional powers or exponents. So that's what we're working on. So uh, we're kind of taking it above and beyond, right? Uh, We've got two times one plus X to the one half minus X times one plus X to the negative one half over X plus one. One thing that I want you to notice, right, is that one plus X is, is the same as X plus one. Now that's not the same for subtraction, right? three minus two is different from two minus three, but three plus two is the same as two plus three. So always kind of convince yourself before you go ahead and make, make changes, right? So here, I'm gonna highlight that and say, this is the same as one plus X. And the reason I'm saying that is because I have one plus X here and one plus X here. So I'm going to be able to factor out a one plus X. So making it look like one plus X uh, is, is going to make things easier later on. All right. So here we go. I can factor out uh, a common factor of one plus X to the negative one half. Let's remind ourselves what one plus X to the negative one half actually is. One plus X to the negative one half well, the negative means 
it should actually be down in the denominator, right? It's just been brought upstairs, but um, but to bring it downstairs, right? We'd have to be multiplying down here, and we're not. So, uh, but really, one plus x to the negative one half is one over one plus x to the one half, and then the power of one half just means you're taking the square root, right? So here, just as a note. one plus x to the negative one half is really the same as one over the square root of one plus x. Now that's not how we're going to uh, work with it, but it is good to kind of remind yourself of what these powers mean or what these exponents mean, right? So the negative bumps it downstairs and the one half uh, is the square root. We're just going to use the power of negative one half, but uh, I just think it's really important to kind of keep that in mind. Same thing here, this power of one half is really two times the root of one plus x. Right. All right, so we've got a couple of things that we've kind of made note of. I can rewrite x plus one as one plus x, which I'm gonna do in this next step here. Um, but also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite Right, so here I'll make a note in pink. We can factor out the lowest power of one plus x, which in this case is one plus x to the negative one half. Okay, so we've already done problems like this but I know no one likes them, so that's why we're, I'm forcing you to do them again. Okay. What do we do? You have to rewrite this. So if, if I've decided, okay, this is my lowest power, then I should be able to rewrite this guy, one plus x to the one half, as uh, some factor of one plus x to the negative one half. So what you need to do is you need to think, okay, well, if I need to extract a negative one half from one half, right? Remember, if you have the same base, then you have to add those exponents, right? So if I'm pulling out a negative one half to get it back to positive one half, I need to add one, right? And so that's, that's how we're gonna factor this thing. So we get two times one plus X to the negative one half times one plus X and then I'll just emphasize that this is to the power of one here, right? One plus negative one half, you, can, you should always just kind of make sure, convince yourself that what you're doing makes sense, right? Negative one half plus one, because I have the same base, negative one half plus one is one half, right? So, okay, good. I haven't actually changed the value I've just changed what it looks like. Okay, so uh, so now I've got this kind of this extra factor of uh, negative one half, and so then I can rewrite this, or I'll just keep this next part the same. X minus or x times sorry, too early still. Uh, x times one plus x to the negative one half. Okay. So now it's clear to me that I, I should, I'll be able to pull out the common factor of one plus X to the negative one half. Now, uh, a couple of things I could do here, right? I can pull it outside and then I could bring it downstairs to the denominator, or I can, uh, this was kind of my, my side, I went a little rogue, I guess, in my mind. Uh, but another thing I could do is I could rewrite x plus one as I could do the same thing that I did here, right? Um, and then I'll be able to cancel. So how about we do that? How about I go off the beaten track here? So x plus one is gonna be Right? Remember, I can rewrite it as one plus X, just to emphasize that it's gonna be the same as, as these guys here. 
if I extract a negative one half here, okay, and I need to get it back to just, oops, uh, x plus one or one plus x, if I've pulled out a negative one half, then I need to add one and a half to get back to one, right? One and a half is three over two. So I get uh, one plus x to the power of three over two. Okay. So now what I can do is, and what I want to do is here, I'm just going to write option number one. Okay. And then I'll show you the other way that I have on my, on my, when I worked through it earlier this morning. Um, right. And you'll see, you end up at the same spot and it doesn't actually change anything. So yeah, but it's nice to have multiple options. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this common factor of one plus X to the negative one half, and I'm going to have one plus X to the negative one half. And then I'll use square brackets to, to show that, okay, that's all times this. So everything that's left over two times one plus X minus X over one plus X to the negative one half times one plus X to the three over two. Okay. Notice that what I've done here is now because there's a common multiple of one plus X to the negative one half, I'm able to cancel these guys right? only because they're multiplying. And then I can simplify a little bit up here, right? Expand this two inside two plus two X minus X puts me at two plus X. I had to think about that one. So this becomes two plus X over one plus X to the three over two. So that's option number one, rewriting the uh, denominator. Maybe I'll clarify that here. Rewrite the denominator. Yeah. Let's do option number two. Option number two is uh, we start with this uh, numerator and then we leave the denominator alone. So option number two just to show you uh, is to um, I want to say move the uh, the factor to the denominator. Maybe I should summarize it as collect like terms. Jury's still out on how I should kind of summarize this thing. But so we start here because we've already done the work of factoring out that common factor of one plus X to the negative one half. That step I have to do regardless. I'm just showing you different ways that you can manipulate the denominator. So we have two times, okay, here we go. Two times one plus X to the negative one half times one plus X to the power of one minus X times one plus X to the negative one half. Let me just make sure that that, that I copied that outright. Yeah. All over one plus X, right? So here, notice that I'm, I'm keeping the denominator as it was. Okay. And my next step, I'm going to pull out this common factor. Same idea, 1 plus x to the negative 1 half, all times 2 times 1 plus x minus x. Numerator behaves the same over 1 plus x going to put brackets around just so I can easily see that these two things are the same. 
So now, like I kind of gave you a heads up earlier, right? This negative one half is really just saying, okay, well, one plus X to the one half belongs in the denominator. It's just been moved upstairs. So we had to make a negative. So I can move it back downstairs. So I have uh, two plus two X minus X. I'll show that step this time. Uh, and then one plus X to the one half times one plus X. And I'll just show that it's to the power of one, right? You shouldn't, uh, actually, I won't. It is to the power of one, we know that. To combine these, right? I've got one half plus one, which if you uh, rewrote one as two over two, right? That's three, one, one over two plus three over two, right? To the power of two over two, I will write that because then it's easy to see that this becomes three over two, which we all know is one half, right? So whether you went straight to three over two, or if you actually found the common denominator and added them, either way, you're gonna end up at the same number, which becomes two plus X over one plus X to the power of three over two. Notice that either way, we end up with the same answer. It's just how your brain might work, right? So I, I want you to use whichever, um, whichever option your brain goes to first, right? So uh, it would have been helpful if, uh, if you had the chance to, to work through this on your own to see kind of which option you would go with. But uh, now you have both and you can kind of try it out. Okay, uh, we also talked about rationalizing, rationalizing the numerator or rationalizing the denominator. And I know this is a long review, uh, but it was a big section that we covered, so I don't mind reviewing it. Uh, we, we did, I can't remember which one we did, but uh, or which ones. But how about we do one of these where we rationalize the numerator? Remember, rationalizing just means getting rid of any square roots or any roots. And in this case, we want to get rid of them in the numerator. If we're rationalizing the denominator, it means we want to, um, I want to say remove square roots from the denominator, but really what we're doing, what we saw was we end up moving the square roots from the top, uh, from the bottom to the top. Same thing if we want to rationalize the numerator, we're really just shifting those roots to, uh, to the denominator kind of in a clever way. So let's do, uh, let's do 94. 94 looks nasty. I was tempted to do 93, nice and easy. But how about we do 94 instead? I know I should be picking 94. Is that what the yes is for? Yeah. <laughs> so um, here I've got a ton of a ton of roots, right? And so if I'm asked to rationalize the numerator, my only goal here is to to move the square roots from the, the numerator down to the denominator. I don't actually care that there are roots in the denominator. There will be. Uh, but I'm just trying to, to kind of shake out non roots from the numerator. So to do that, we, we multiply by one, right? We use that trick a lot, right? Uh, but we pick a convenient value of one. So remember the conjugate, the conjugate is just the opposite. So if you have a root or just a number, right? If you have something like this, Right? The conjugate of one minus root five is one plus root five. So here you would multiply by one plus root five over one plus root five. 
So only the addition or subtraction changes. Okay, here the conjugate is root x plus the root of x plus h. Okay, so that's what I need to multiply by. Okay. So 94. I've got the root x minus the root of x plus h over h times the root of x times the root of x plus h. I'll make a note here that the conjugate is the root of x plus the root of x plus h. Notice that the only thing that I've changed here is the addition right, instead of subtraction. So once you get the hang of that, it's actually uh, quite, quite simple. Okay, so if I multiply by the conjugate, well, I can't just multiply by a number and change the value. I have to, uh, what's implied there is I have to multiply it by the conjugate as a value of one. So this becomes the root of x minus the root of x plus h, just rewriting the fraction here, h times the root of x times the root of x plus h. Then times the root of x plus the root of x plus h over the root of x plus the root of x plus h. All right, and I'll just make a note here. I'm multiplying by the conjugate. Multiply by the conjugate. Okay. What I want you to remember is that there are brackets around all of these, right? So here you're multiplying fractions. So you wanna make sure that because there's subtraction and addition here, you have to expand all those terms, right? So let's do this properly and just expand it. It's gonna get quite large and then it's gonna simplify down. So kind of, Keep your roots, remember the root of x times the root of x is just x, x to the one half times x to the one half is x to the one half plus one half, which is one, right? So if you have to convince yourself using those exponents, then uh, fine, do that. Or you can just remember that the root of something times the root of that same thing is just whatever's in the root. So expanding this out, Right? I need the root of x times the root of x plus the root of x times the root of x plus h plus the root of x times the root of x plus h and then minus the root of x plus h times the root of x. To emphasize that it's the same term as this, I'm going to rewrite the order. So minus the root of x times the root of x plus h and then uh, minus the root of x plus h times the root of x plus h. That's the numerator. How about the denominator? All these terms are being multiplied together, right? So when I expand it, I really just, if you, if you think of these as a, times b plus c, you would get ab plus ac, right? So uh, lots of terms in this first one, but we're just multiplying it in, right? And so we get h times the root of x times the root of x plus h times the root of x plus h times the root of x times the root of x plus h times the root of x plus h. Yeah. Now, right, I'll just go through and just kind of highlight, okay, well, here I've got the root of the same thing times the root of the same thing, that's going to be x. And then this, so this is x, this is x plus h. Of course, this is going to go away, right? The root of x times the root of x plus h minus the same thing that's going to cancel out. 
And, and that is the reason we multiply by the conjugate, right? It's because those center terms are going to cancel out. So if you're working on these problems and you're finding that they're not canceling out, uh, you've, you've done it wrong. Okay, so, so um, notice now I've got x minus x plus h. There are no more roots in the numerator, which is what we were going for, right? We were rationalizing the numerator. I still need to simplify the denominator here. What we are seeing here is that I've got a root x times a root of x. So that's just going to be x, right? And then here I've got a, a root of x plus h times the root of x plus h. So that's going to be x and this is going to be x plus h. So I'm going to try to, to simplify the denominator a little bit here. So the numerator I'm done with x minus x plus h. Remember that x plus h is in brackets because it's all minus that, right? So you have to expand that negative inside. Over, and I've got h times x times the root of x plus h. Okay, I can probably rewrite that some, some clever way, but uh, for now, we'll just leave it. And then plus h times x plus h times the root of x. <clears throat> I'm not quite satisfied with this thing. I could just leave it here because I don't actually think it's going to, I'm not going to be able to cancel anything out here. Uh, but I can simplify the numerator a little bit. So let's just keep massaging this thing. So x minus x minus h, be really careful, expand that negative inside. Over, okay, so I've got h, oops, I've got hx times the root of x plus h. There's nothing I can, can do here. Um, but I can expand this out and see if I can shake anything out. So I've got uh, hx times the root of x plus h plus h root x times x. Plus h squared root x however you want to, maybe I'll rewrite this so it's following the same pattern, hx root x. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything to simplify this any further. I want you to be really careful right? Because you might be tempted to break up this square root, but you can't, right? Because you're adding inside. So as soon as you're adding or subtracting under the square root, there's nothing you can do. You can't break that up. You can't change it. Only if you're multiplying under the square root, that's when you're allowed to split those up because it's an exponent, right? The square root is an exponent. Okay, so I guess... Hmm. There's nothing really, I can pull out a common factor of H, but I don't know, it doesn't really, oh, maybe that'll work. Why did I light up? Oh, maybe that'll work because X minus X, that's going to go away. Up top here, I'm just going to have negative H. So if I am able to pull out a common factor of H here, that's great, right? Then I can cancel something. Okay, so let's do that. X minus X, I'll just show that, of course, that goes to zero. So then I have negative H over H times, and maybe I'll use square brackets just to show that this single H is times everything here x times the root of x plus h plus x root x plus 
root x. I can do some weird stuff like pull out a common factor of root x here. I'm not going to bother, but the key thing is I was able to pull out a common factor of h, so now I can cancel this thing here. Right, h over h, don't forget this negative, right? But what we end up with is this is going to be negative 1 over x times the root of x plus h plus x times the root of x plus the root of x. I'm going to leave it here, right? But uh, I don't have any fraction, or sorry, I don't have any uh, roots in the numerator, which was the goal, right? Rationalize the numerator means get rid of all the, the roots in the numerator. But we do have roots in the denominator, but that's fine. So that's a big one, but nice work. Okay. End of review. Probably pages and pages of review here. Okay. So <laughs> let's see here. Our next section, and maybe, maybe we should take a little break before we, I know, a break before the review. Because um, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to give you breaks. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How about we do a, a little break, break until, uh, what time is it, 8.45, uh, how about just 8.50? And then we'll start a new section. Shake the cobwebs out. Yeah, make sure you caffeinate after that. Ooh, shake it off, shake it off. Let's start a new section. So, um, big review today, yikes. Uh, not my intention actually, but uh, it's good to work through all that. All right, so section 1.8 um, is on inequalities. Inequalities. Inequalities are, uh, well, whenever things aren't equal to, right? So we're used to equalities, uh, equal signs. Uh, but if you have something like this, right, that's less than, Remember, we specify, and we've already dealt with inequalities, right, in terms of the number line. And so, but I just want to have it here because the section is called inequalities, right? Uh, less than or equal to, we have to specify with the number line. So less than or equal to. And remember that trick, uh, you make an L, kind of like a loser one, uh, a loser L with your left hand. And then if you hold it over the less than sign, right, it's going to look like an L. And then that way you can just read it as, uh, so if you have something like A is less than B, right, then you can just read it across. And of course, if it's the other way, well, then it doesn't make an L, so then it must be greater than, right? So you only need to remember one to remember the other one. Uh, and then, of course, greater than, greater than or equal to, and the last inequality is the not equal to. Which 
Um, in terms of the behavior that we're about to talk about, uh, the not equal to sign, it follows that behavior, but because both sides of that thing is, is the same, right? If I say A is not equal to B, that's the same as saying B is not equal to A, right? So it doesn't have that, um, it doesn't matter which side it's the, the values are on, right? So it's always just gonna be not equal to, but uh, the rules still apply. Now for, for doing math with inequalities, uh, most of the time you can just treat them as equal signs. Okay, so most of the time, oops, I don't know what happened there. Uh, most, most of the time, we can, uh, we can treat inequalities, inequalities as equal signs. Right, so we can uh, we can move stuff around. We can subtract something from both sides, right? And and the inequality would stay the same. However, and I'll put this maybe in pink. It's uh, less glaring than red, maybe. Uh, so most of the time, we can just treat these inequalities as if they're equal signs. The only time that you need to put like a a brain stopper on is if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative number. If multiplying or dividing both sides by a negative number, by a negative number, We must switch the direction of the inequality. Okay, that's going to be, I'll put it, I'll even do an exclamation mark. Okay. Uh, there's one other situation if we take reciprocals, but we're not actually going to come across that. So for now, I, this is the only kind of mental stopper that, uh, that I need you to remember. Okay, so as soon as you have to multiply or divide by a negative number, right? So as soon as you're multiplying or dividing, you need to put a stop and say, okay, is it negative? In that case, I need to switch the sign. So let's, uh, oh, maybe I'll bring in, <laughs> I'll bring in uh, the rules. Oh, I guess it's not one of those, okay. Bring in the rules so that we have them and then let's do an example. So, We'll just talk about the, the rules first. So if A is less than or equal to B, then that's the same. So if I add C to both sides, everything stays the same. Okay. Uh, same thing if I subtract C from both sides, I'm allowed to do that, right? So, but then if C is positive, right? If C is greater than zero, then if I multiply both sides by a positive number, the inequality stays the same, right? So notice we can just treat this inequality as if it's an equal sign until if C is less than zero. So if this constant or C is negative, then if A is less than or equal to B, then the negative times A is greater than, so notice the switch, is greater than or equal to the negative times b. Okay. So here, this is the one that we just talked about just in, um, in variable notation. Uh, if a is greater than zero, so if a is positive and b is positive, then if A is less than or equal to B, then one over A is greater than. So this is the other situation where uh, it switches the, the inequality, but we're not gonna be, this, this doesn't come up for us. So 
uh, I mean, have it in, in your mind that, oh, okay, there's another rule around inequalities, you know, if things aren't working out. Um, but, uh, right, so if you have two is less than or equal to three, right, if you think about one half versus one third, one half is more than one third, right? So you can always convince yourself if you just pick easy values for A, B, and C, if, if you need a C, uh, that satisfy these criteria, you can always kind of convince yourself. Uh, you can add inequalities. So if A is less than B and C is less than D, then A plus C is still going to be less than B plus D. And then, uh, of course, we've got this kind of transitive property, which says, okay, well, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then of course A is less than C. That's easier to talk about uh, just in words, right? Uh, it makes sense uh, when you kind of read it out loud. Um, so of course, that's kind of common sense and, and um, it still applies. So let's do some, uh, let's do an example or two, uh, 1.8. And here I've, I've got the a special, like a little note here, pay special attention to rules three and four. Okay, so I uh, got a little example of what we just established, but let's just go through. So we can work with this thing and how about, uh, I'll put it on its own page, fine. It's so big. Okay. First thing I wanna do is let's do something kind of breezy like, like 15 just to get into the groove here. Um, We've already talked about linear equations, right? So linear equations are things like y equals mx plus b. Remember, we just have one x and the highest power of x is one, then you have a linear equation. So we can have linear inequalities, right? All that means is that we're gonna have a line and we're interested in everything maybe below it or above that line, okay? So linear inequalities uh, are still just lines um, but now we're looking at some, some region above or below it, depending on the inequality. Okay. Uh, so, and then it says express the solution using interval notation and graph the solution set. Um, so let's do it. We'll, how about we use Desmos to, to graph the solution set easier. Uh, or at least to visualize it. 2x minus 5 is greater than 3, so not equal to 3. Okay. So number 15, I've got it here on the side. 2x minus 5 is greater than 3. So what I want you to do is, just to make these a little less daunting, just read this as 2x minus 5 is equal to 3, and then uh, just have that mental stopper of if you're multiplying or dividing by negative, you have to switch the sign, right? But otherwise, you can just keep going. So if I'm trying to solve, solve the linear inequality, what I'm trying to solve is I need to find x, okay? So, um, right, there's nothing else to solve for, so all right, let's solve for x. So, I'm trying to get x on its own, so that means I have to add 5 to both sides. And this might be one of those times where if you say what you're doing, then uh, you'll easy, like, um, you should be able to hear yourself saying multiply by negative 2, and then that should kind of stop you, right? So to switch the sign. So if I add 5 to both sides, I get 2x is greater than three plus five, okay, which is eight. So then if I divide by two on both sides, so again, I'm dividing by two, not a negative, so I'm safe. So then x is greater than eight divided by two, 
or x is greater than four. Okay. So in terms of, I think they wanted the solution in interval notation. If x is greater than four, but not equal to four, right? That looks like, uh, so the solution then is going to be from four up to positive infinity, round brackets around both of those. I think they mean graph the solution set on a number line. But what I want to do is I want to show you um, how to graph this in Desmos. Okay, So 2x minus 5, that's a line, and it has to be greater than 3. Okay. So how about we just take that 2x minus 5, so the original equation, 2x minus 5 greater than 3, and put it in Desmos and see what it gives us. So 2x minus 5, 2x minus 5, OK, so that's a line. And it has to be greater than, notice that you've got these inequalities on here, greater than 3. Okay. It gives us the region where this is true, right? So here, right, in Desmos, it's just going to give you the region where 2x minus 5 is greater than 3. So really what we're doing, if we take away this inequality here, what we've said is if we draw another line at y equals 3, what we've said is, OK, Here's my, my line. The blue one is my, my line, 2x minus 5. And my inequality says I want it all the values where, so all the values of x where it's greater than y equals 3. And so all these values of x uh, to the right of 4 are going to apply. It's not letting me trace along here. There we go. All right, so from this point, that's where it's greater than 3. So that's what we're doing. Um, and we're not going to go through section 1.11, but essentially that's, that's what 1.11 is, is showing you, that you can graph these things to solve inequalities, right? So here we found at x equals 4, that's where it crosses over and, it's, and all our y's are greater than 3. So let's do let's do twenty one. Okay. Again, we want to solve for the x that makes this happen. So twenty one is four x minus seven divided by eight plus nine x. I've got x's on either side here. So what I need to do, just as if this was a, an equal sign, right? I would bring all my x's to one side and all my numbers to the other side uh, and eventually just shake out that x. So same, same deal, right? Uh, I am going to, uh, just to emphasize, I'm going to bring this 9x over to the left-hand side, and I'm going to bring this 7 over to the right-hand side. I'm going to do it in one move, OK? So here we go. So I get 4x minus 9x. Subtracting is fine, right? It's the division that's, that's bad. Uh, well, not bad, but we have to switch the sign. Uh, is less than 8 plus 7, right? So adding 7 to both sides is fine as well. Okay. So 4x minus 9x, what have I forced here? I've forced a negative, right? So um, 4 minus 9 makes negative 5. Negative 5x is less than 8 plus 7 is 15. Notice here, 
that in order to get x on its own, I need to divide by negative five, right? And so here, I'll just kind of highlight here, we have to divide by negative. So in doing that, I need to switch the sign. Okay, so I'm just gonna highlight that here. I need to switch the direction of that sign. And what I end up with here is x is greater than 15 divided by negative five. 15 divided by negative five puts me at negative three. So x is greater than negative three. You can always, what's nice about inequalities and equalities uh, is that you can always try values. Um, oh yeah, sure. Uh, so you can always try values that satisfy the criteria and just make sure that the original, um, oh, so we switch, we have to switch the sign because uh, let's go back here, right? If you're multiplying or, oh, it's catching up, sorry. Uh, if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative number, you have to switch the direction of the sign. So that's just a rule that we need to keep in mind. So, oh. Awesome. And it, that same rule is summarized here in the, in the handout, but um, let's go back here. So what you can do is you can pick a value of X that is greater than negative three. So uh, I don't know, zero seems like a nice option, right? In my mind, I can easily use X equals zero. X equals zero is greater than negative three. So four times zero, zero. So negative seven, is less than eight plus nine times zero, negative seven is less than eight, right? Whereas if we hadn't switched the sign, right? If we hadn't switched that sign, then we would be saying, okay, X should be less than negative three. So then I would be picking, uh, let's say, you know, negative five, right? Four times negative five, that's negative 20 minus seven. Okay, head math, yikes. Uh, negative 27. And then is that less than eight plus nine times negative five? No, it's not, right? Because I know nine times negative five is negative 45. Eight minus 45 is not less than negative 27, right? So you, if you're not sure if you switch the sign correctly, right, you can always pick values and plug them in and the inequality should be true if you've solved it, right? So in terms of our solution here in, uh, so the solution, if X has to be greater than negative three, but not equal to negative three, in interval notation, I need negative three to infinity. Now, what I want you to recognize, and this is gonna lead into the next section as well. Uh, this is a straight line, four X minus seven, and this is a straight line, eight plus nine X, right? So we need to, to quickly recognize these straight line equations. Uh, if it's anything like MX plus BY equals MX plus B, then you have a straight line. Here, this is a straight line, this is a straight line. What we have, right, is we have a, a line or two lines like this, maybe they go like this. And so what we want to find is where one line, the outputs of one line are less than the other line. So let's graph this in Desmos just to see what, uh, what this looks like. And okay, I've got it here on the side. So the first line is 4x minus 7. Okay, so there's my first line. And it has to be less than eight plus nine X. Okay. 
this is where things kind of get dicey and you can absolutely just use Desmos to say, okay, 4x minus seven has to be uh, less than eight plus nine x. Okay. It highlights the region where that's true, right? So it doesn't actually give you the, um, the lines like we drew here. Sorry, it's catching up. Okay, so what we found, right, is that intersection, negative three, negative 19. Negative three is the value of X that we found, so that's good, matches what we found. But the purple line is four X minus seven, and the black line is eight plus nine X. So the condition was that this purple line has to be less than uh, the black line. Okay, so for me, even for me, uh, and I've done these a lot, I have a really hard time uh, seeing which line is less than the other. So that's why using Desmos like this is really handy for me, uh, because then I can just kind of, okay, so the outputs are less for the purple line than the black line in this red region. Okay. So play around with Desmos to see, um, to see what's going on. Okay. Uh, I also wanna do something kind of weird, like maybe 36. Notice that uh, starting at 29, I think, notice that there is something in the middle and then there's inequalities on both sides, right? We can still work with that, um, just remembering the rules. If you're multiplying or dividing by negative, you have to switch the signs, uh, okay? Uh, but as long as you're doing the same thing to, to all three regions, right? So not just both sides, but all three regions this time, uh, then you can still manipulate inequalities. So let's do, let's do 36 here. So I've got negative one over two is less than or equal to four minus three X divided by five is less than or equal to one over four. Okay. So now notice I've got three regions here. I'll call them three regions. There's only one X here. It's possible that there are X's, you know, on on all sides and then you would have to collect those like terms just like you would with an with an equality but for now uh we've just got the one x here in the middle and we want to get x on its own right we want to end up with x being you know maybe between negative three and four right is ultimately what we're going to end up with just like you would if you, so just take your hand and cover the negative one half section for now, right? So just like you would if you had to solve for X um, with four minus three X over five is less than or equal to one over four, you would start picking away, right? Multiply both sides by five and then the subtract four from both sides and then divide by negative three. I have to switch the signs, right? So I'm not just doing that to this one side, this one over four. Now lift your hand away. Now you have to do it to, uh, to both sides simultaneously, right? So you're gonna multiply both sides by, or I guess all three regions by five. Then you're gonna subtract four from all three regions. Then you're gonna divide by negative three from all three regions, making sure that you switch the sign. Okay. So let's, let's do it. Uh, we must... Uh, manipulate all three regions the same. Okay. 
So trying to get X on its own, what I have here, and I'm going to use a different color for each step that I'm doing, right? And so I have negative one over two is less than, right? Leaving a little bit of room because I need to multiply by five, right? Is less than or equal to four, oops, four minus three X over five times five, which is less than or equal to one over four times five, right? So you know how to solve these, right? If you just had four minus three X over five is less than or equal to one over four, you know how to solve that, right? Solve for X. But now we've got these three regions, but as long as you're doing everything to both sides. It's like you're doing two calculations at the same time. Um, then you're going to be safe. Okay. So here, this 5 over 5 cancels with that 5 over 5. Okay. So now I'm going to summarize. I'll just do the calculation. Negative 5 over 2 is less than or equal to 4 minus 3x, which is less than or equal to 5 over 4. Right, just to kind of clean it up a little bit before I do the next step. Or maybe I can do the next step on the same line, right? Because what do I need to do next? If I'm trying to get X on its own, I need to subtract four from both sides. Subtracting, right, is okay. I can subtract safely. So I don't have to change the signs quite yet. I'll do it here. Negative 5 over 2 minus 4 is less than or equal to 4 minus 3x minus 4. Less than or equal to 5, oops, 5 over 5, 5 over 4. Oops, minus 4. Uh, this one's giving a giving us some some work here, right? I've got a fraction minus a, a fraction four over one, right here. I'm subtracting fractions again. Oh boy, right. So I need to do a little bit of work there, but what I've done is I've canceled. So four minus four is going to go away. Okay. Uh, this. And in order to combine this, and I, um, I would combine this and simplify this before I go ahead and divide by negative three, because otherwise it's going to make a real mess, right? So let's go ahead and simplify this first before I, I keep going. Okay. So I get uh, negative five over two minus four times two over two, okay, is less than or equal to negative three X, which is less than or equal to five over four minus four times four over four. Okay, now I can simplify negative five minus eight, uh oh, Negatives. Negative 5 minus 8, negative 13. Good. So I have negative 13 divided by 2 is less than or equal to negative 3x, which is less than or equal to 5 minus 16, negative 11 over 4. Okay. What we should do. Right? In terms of a number line, negative 13 over 2 should still be less than negative 11 over 4. Right? So let's just make sure when I do negative 13 divided by 2, that's negative 6 and a half. So here I'm just going to just kind of check my work, roughly negative 6 and a half. And this is roughly negative 11 divided by 4. Sorry, excuse me. 
negative two. Good thing we're not meeting in person because I've got such a runny nose. <laughs> but it's just me and the dog, so I think. I'm not spreading anything to anyone. All right. So in terms of a number line, right, if you had to map this out, negative six and a half is less than negative 2.75. So that's good. So this was just kind of a check in point. Uh, is this really a true statement? Yes, it is. Right. And so now Right. I just wanted to confirm that I was on the right track. I am. Now what I need to do is I need to divide both sides by negative three. And this negative three, right, means I have to switch the sign. So, right, when I divide by negative three, these signs have to get switched around. So I'm going to do that right away. So I have, okay, negative 13 over two, and then that's divided by negative three. Notice how I'm, I'm structuring it like as if it's a fraction over a fraction, right? Because then when I flip and multiply that negative three, I can treat it as negative three over one, right? And so, oh, I guess I should, do it in the different color because I've been trying to do that all along. I've already switched the signs, all right? So, okay, good. Uh, and then negative three X divided by negative three, that's gonna cancel out. Negative three over negative three is one, one times X. And then negative 11 over four, and then that's getting divided by negative three. Okay. And just to kind of highlight here, a fraction over a fraction, right? So, and I know how to deal with that. I flip and multiply. And so I get negative 13 over two times, now, Negative three over one is the same thing as negative one over three. So I always like to have the negative on the numerator uh, unless, unless it's making a real mess. But most of the time I like to just kind of keep the negative on the numerator. Notice here negative 13. Because um, then when I multiply those, I can see that, that negative fall away and become positive. Right, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have negative one over three is greater than or equal to x, which is greater than or equal to negative 11 over four times negative one over three. Okay. Now, right, when I multiply this out, I get a negative times a negative makes a positive and same thing here. So what I'm gonna get is 13 over six is greater than or equal to X, which is greater than or equal to 11 over 12. <laughs> All right, so typically with inequalities, we like to have uh, you know, A is less than B is less than C is less than D, right? You can keep going, but uh, we don't really like to have the largest value on the left and the smallest value on the right. Now, what I want you to do is just kind of uh, do it on your calculator, right? 13 divided by six is roughly 2.167. And 11 divided by 12 is roughly 0.9167. So here, if you think about it that way, <laughs> right, I want you to keep the fractions. I want the exact answer. These are approximate answers. I want the exact answers. But when you think about it that way, so saying 
uh, 2.167 is greater than X and it's greater than, which is greater than 0.9167, uh, doesn't really sound good, right? So what I want you to do is just kind of um, write it from the smallest value up to the largest value. So 11 over 12 is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to 13 over six. Rewrite from smallest to largest. And just make sure that the, the I hate to say mouth of the inequality is still facing the X the same way that it was up here, right? You don't want to change the, the meaning of the inequalities, but all I'm doing is I'm just kind of switching these things around so that they read nicely. All right, nice inequalities. All right. All right. So these were linear inequalities. And let's see here. Uh, should we graph this? Sure. Uh, actually, yeah, OK, fine. Yeah, let's graph this. So we've got this, this is a line, right? Four minus three X over five. You can rewrite as four over five minus three over five X, right? So this is still a line and that line, the output of that line, what we're saying has to be between negative one half and positive one over four. So we can just translate this whole thing into Desmos and I've, I'll pull it up here. Just to confirm that the, the region that we found is, is the right one. So I've got, and just kind of plug it in the exact same way that you see it in the problem, negative one over two, and then step it outside because you want to keep the inequality outside the fraction uh, is less than or equal to now, as soon as I have a fraction with multiple terms in the numerator, I'm going to put a bracket around there. 4 minus 3x in brackets divided by 5. Because then that's the only way that I'm going to be able to divide everything by 5. Step it outside. Is less than or equal to 1 over 4. Oops, 1 over 4. Uh, where's my, oh, it doesn't like that. What's it complaining about? Um, oh, I see. They only want one inequality. So it's going to be the overlap of the two. So then I'm going to do four X mine, oops, four minus three X divided by five, and that has to be less than or equal to one over four. So the overlap here is between 0.917 and 2.167, sound familiar? Right? And that's what we found. And I guess I should give this as uh, an inequal, or sorry, interval notation. So the solution, We can include these endpoints, right? So we use square brackets is from 11 over 12 up to 13 over six, including those endpoints. In our interval notation, we have to write it from smallest to largest, right? And so that's why uh, it's good to check, right? I, I don't know 13 over six versus 11 over 12. I suspect that this is smaller than 13 over six, but um, I, I don't know that, right? So just use your calculator. Um, 
And then for interval notation, you have to write it from smallest to largest because remember, it's just reading uh, across the number line. Right. Good. Okay. Let's see here. Solving nonlinear inequalities. So here we were solving linear inequalities. Uh, solving nonlinear inequalities is a little bit of work. Okay. Um, not bad, 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 but uh, I'm just wondering if I need to keep you, have you fresh for it. Um, we're going to have to cut into a little bit of our review time, but just as a heads up, I will post a, a practice test for test one that you can work through before our review class. So, um, and I'll send out an announcement once it's uh, available. I think I have one ready, so it should be, I think, I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. So solving nonlinear inequalities. That's going to be where the powers of x, right? So nonlinear is just saying that the power, the highest power of x is more than one. highest power of x is inequalities, let's use them, is greater than 1. Right? So <clears throat> what we do is the easiest way to solve nonlinear inequalities is if we talk about how they relate to 0. Right? And so um, for example, a nonlinear inequality that we've talked about, or a nonlinear function rather, that we've talked about is maybe the quadratic function. Right? So the quadratic is something like ax squared plus bx plus c. Right? We've we've kind of worked with this thing a lot, right? And when it's facing down, just as a heads up, the A is negative, doesn't matter, but uh, we're gonna talk about it eventually, so why not now? What have we done? We've done things like we've used the quadratic formula to find the, the x-intercepts, right? So we have tools for finding where it crosses the, the x-axis. Here, this is where the, the x-axis is where y is equal to zero, right? So really what we've been able to solve for is where it's equal to zero. So the natural extension here would be, okay, well, if I can find the points where it's equal to zero, right? And now if I'm talking about inequalities, well, maybe if I can talk about where it's less than zero, right? on either side here or here, or if I'm interested in where it's greater than zero, then that's easy to do, right? Because I've got these cutoff points and then it's just gonna be, you know, this region between these two points if it's greater than zero or the region up to this point and then picking up at this point again if it's less than zero, right? And so, um, so we use these roots quite a bit um, and so that's why it's going to be really useful to be able to factor the quadratic or at least find the roots uh, and then we can go from there. So uh, it's just an extension of working with a quadratic equation, right, because now we're just interested in, okay, which region gives me values that are larger than zero, right, or greater than zero or potentially less than zero. The key, key thing here when we're solving these is uh, you want to set your inequality with respect to zero. You can do it for, okay, where is it less than three, for example, right? But it just adds a, an unnecessary level of difficulty, 
right? So if we just rearrange our, our um, quadratic, let's say, with zero on one side, then our inequality can be with respect to zero. So solving nonlinear inequalities Solving nonlinear inequalities will be easier if we um, set our inequality, if we set our inequality with respect to zero. All right, so in the handout, I've got just kind of a guidelines for solving nonlinear inequalities. So like we said here, if we're solving nonlinear inequalities, we're going to find that it's easier if we just move everything to one side and have zero on the on the other side. So on one side, so move all the terms to one side. And so if necessary, you should rearrange it so that you have uh, zero on one side of the inequality. Okay. Then if the if the equation is not factored already, then you should factor it, right? And so we know how to factor quadratics, right? And anything larger than a quadratic, I'll just give it to you. I'll, I'll give you the factored version, unless it's something easy, like you can do it by grouping, right? We have those factoring tools that we've developed. So, uh, so factoring is gonna come into play here, okay? Then, we're gonna find the intervals that satisfy the inequality. So um, first you're gonna find the intervals for uh, where this thing is zero. So like we said up here, right? Where does this thing equal zero, right? Those are our cutoff points. And then we say, okay, well, with, with respect to if it's greater than zero or less than zero, that depends on, um, on the inequality, right? And then we can just look at, okay, well, how does it behave around these points, these fact or uh, these zeros? So here's here's kind of the tricky part. What you want to do is just to convince yourself. Uh, what we do is we make a table. We just make a, a a little table where we use test values to see if things are greater than or less than zero. So to see and and here's where it gets a little dicey. Uh, and this is why I maybe wanted you fresh for this section. Um, I used it all up on the review. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> is we're only interested in the sign, right? Which, which is meant to make things easier, right? Because you don't actually have to do the calculations. You can just think, Oh, okay, a, a positive times a positive, for example, makes a positive number. A negative times a negative makes a positive number. Knowing that it's positive, well, that tells me that it's greater than zero, right? And then I can refer back to the inequality that I'm working on to see if that's what I want or not, okay? Okay. Um, all right. So I will also bring in from the handout, just a reminder about the sign. So if a product or quotient, a quotient is just a fraction, has an even number of negative factors, then you know it's gonna be positive, right? A negative times a negative is positive. A negative times a negative times a negative times a negative that's a positive. A negative times a negative times a negative, that's three negatives, makes a negative, right? And so we have to remember those rules. 
And then if we have an odd number of negative factors, then it's going to be negative. Right? OK, uh, we have time to do one of these examples. So let's just let's work through this thing and um, see where we're at. And I know you've already had a long day with me, uh, so. But I I, I want to do one example so that we've got one under our under our belts. Okay, so remember the first step. If you go back to that guideline, I'm not going to scroll up there because it's been a little laggy. But remember the first step is to factor this thing. Well, move all the terms over to one side so that you have zero on one side of the inequality. So these first uh, six questions have already done that, right? The first four questions have already factored for you, right? So of course, we're moving from kind of easy to harder questions. Uh, but 41 and 42, you know how to factor these quadratics, right? Even if you move this one. So in 43, if you move that one over to the left hand side, you've got a quadratic again, you know how to factor these quadratics, we've worked on that. Same thing uh, for for all of these, these are all quadratics, I don't see any higher powers than two, right, except 51 and 52, right, 51 and 52, if you were to expand these out, you would have x to the power of three as your highest power. But they've made that easier by giving you the factored version, right? So, so you don't have to factor anything higher than x to the power of two, right? But you are expected to be able to factor quadratics. So this is gonna be a really good exercise in, okay, am I, am I really smooth at factoring quadratics? Because we need to be. And then, um, and then we will be able to use that, right? So, so that's been its own section. And so now we need to be really kind of good at factoring quadratics. So uh, just to give you an idea, how about we do just the first one? And I, I know I had my reminder for my next class, so we'll see how far we get here. But x plus 2 times x plus, oh sorry, x minus 3. Hey, what a mess that would make. x minus 3 has to be less than 0. Not equal to 0, but just less than 0, right? So here, this is a nonlinear inequality. Okay? And I want to solve this, meaning, <clears throat> so solve the nonlinear inequality. What I want to do is I need to solve for the values, uh, potentially, of x that make this true. Right. And then express the solution using interval notation. Uh, I'm not going to graph it on the number line, but we will graph it in decimals. Right. So right away, and I can feel the, the clock slipping away, and, and I'm sure you're sick of me already. Uh, how about we start by graphing this in Desmos just to see what we're doing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this whole thing into Desmos and see what it looks like. So I had bracket x plus 2 times bracket x minus 3. I don't think it needs the multiplier. Desmos is clever that way. Uh, WebAssign, I think, maybe needs the multiplier, but anyways. Uh, so here, this is my nonlinear expression, right? This is my quadratic. This is what it looks like. Then when I add on the inequality that it has to be less than 0, well, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about all these values where the outputs are less than zero, 
right? So the region that should be shaded when I add in the inequality, right? It should be everything in that lower little bit, right? Because I want it to be less than zero. So it's gonna be less than zero between X equals negative two and X equals three. So in the end, that's gonna be our solution. So here I do less than zero. So here we found the region that makes that true, right? But it's not until we've seen the actual graph that we can kind of convince ourselves that, okay, that's true. If we wanted greater than zero, right? Then we would be going from values of X up till negative two, not including negative two, and then pick up again at three, but not including neg or not including three, hey, there, uh, and then up to infinity, right? So depending on the inequality, um, that's going to determine the region that we're interested in. All right. So I have decided to keep you fresh, right? Uh, but what we found in Desmos And we found that it looks something like this. Okay. And we said that this is at negative two and this was at three. Negative two, zero, and three, zero. We should probably use proper notation. So what we said was okay, this whole thing is going to be less than zero between negative two and three, not including those endpoints, right? And so that's where we'll pick up. We'll, we'll actually go through and solve this, but try following those guidelines, the steps that we have here. Whoop. Try following those steps and, and try doing it on your own to see, see how it works out. Okay. All right. So we'll pick up there on ugh, Tuesday and uh, We'll see. We might have to kind of dig into our review time a little bit. All right. But like I said, I'll give you a practice test, so it should be okay. Any questions? If not, have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday.